Bapar sir, can you say something? Yes. Yes, am I audible? Subhash ji, am I audible? Subhash ji, am I audible? Yes, you are. You are Dr. Bapar. Okay, you are audible. Thank you. बापट सर गुड टू गो थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम ऑल दी रिस्पेक्टेड डिग्नेटरीज आई डॉक्टर गौतम बापट ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डॉक्टर विश्वनाथ गराट एम आई टी वर्ल्ड पीस यूनिवर्सिटी पुणे भारत इन एसोसिएशन विद पुणे डिस्ट्रिक्ट बार एसोसिएशन पुणे भारत वुड लाइक टू वेलकम ईच वन ऑफ यू for this very first four day international symposium on law and peace the theme of which is role of law to promote culture of peace my friends i'm sure from the theme itself it would be clear to you what is the need of such symposium in today's time my friends the first international symposium on law and peace as known as islp aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald the peace and harmony through the lens of law the islp strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals youth policy planning policy planners thinkers and global society at large where they can come together for the dialogue open discussions deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building process to promote the culture of peace and harmony for digitally dynamic and very complex society my friends i'm sure you all would be equally thrilled to embark upon this journey of the first international symposium on law and peace i welcome each one of you for this very very important gathering before we start and before we embark upon this journey for next four days let us start by national song vande matram i would like to request everyone to rise in your seats wherever you are on this planet to so please rise in your seats for national song vande matram vande mataram वंदे मातर सुजला सुफला मलयज शीतला श्यामला मातर वंदे मातर
as a mighty group of institutions under the aegis of our revered Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karadza have been following a tradition. We all, for the last 40 years, before we start our day, every day, we pray to the Almighty for the world peace of entire humanity. A prayer which we call as world peace prayer is, is something that we involve with every day so that we can experience peace within. On this note, I would like to request everyone in the audience to please fold their hands, close their eyes, bring the image of their mother, father, their deity in front of their eyes and wholeheartedly participate in the World Peace Prayer. My friends, I would request you to please pay attention to the words. You'll understand that this World Peace Prayer does not talk about any caste, creed, religion, or any section of society. It purely talks about the entire, the, the well-being of entire humanity. I request my technical team to kindly relay the World Peace Prayer. Jaya Jaya Swasam Vedya Atma Rupa Deva Tuti Ganesu Sakalartha Mati Prakashu Mane Nurutti Dasu Avadhari Gudi Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwarha Guru Sakshat Para Brahma Tasma Sri Gurave Namaha Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nascha Pur Namadaya Purnameva Vatishyate Om Shanti 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 Thank you. My friends, now it's time when I invite the co-chairperson of IQAC and Dean of School of Law, Faculty of Liberal Arts and School of Visual Arts, Professor Dr. Anuradha Parasan, Madam, to kindly propose the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Bapat. Uh, respected dignitaries on the dais, distinguished honorable members of legal fraternity, honorable chief justice, honorable justice of Supreme Court, high courts, honorable sitting judges, honorable former judges, distinguished senior advocates, members of Bar Association, advocates, lawyers, fellow colleagues, participants, members from media and press, faculty, staff, and my dear students. A very good morning to one and all. Welcome to the first edition of International Symposium on Law and Peace at Dr. Vishwanath Karad, MIT World Peace University, Pune Bharat. MIT World Peace University, in association with the Pune District Bar Association is organizing this prestigious first international symposium on law and peace from December 14 to 17, 2021 on the theme, role of law to promote the culture of peace. On behalf of MIT WPU leadership, I extend warm welcome to all distinguished members on the virtual dais. I request everyone to join in extending cordial welcome to all distinguished speakers and guests of honors for today's inaugural session. 
we extend warm welcome to special guest of honor justice dr arijit pasayak ji former judge supreme court of india and former chairman competition appellate tribunal please join in extending ardent welcome to special guest of honor advocate bansuri swaraj ji advocate supreme court of india hearty welcome to special guest of honor justice dr bharat bhushan prasun ji senior advocate supreme court of india former judge punjab and haryana high court earnest welcome to patron and organizing chair dr lalit basin ji advocate supreme court of india managing partner basin and company president the society of indian law firms president indian law foundation warm welcome to special guest of honor dr vimal n patel ji member designate un's international law commission vice chancellor rashtriya raksha university and member national security advisory board of india heartfelt welcome to advocate hemant batra ji public policy advocate international corporate and commercial lawyer and vice president sark law earnest hearty welcome to chief guest justice deepak mishra ji former chief justice of india once again warm welcome to all distinguished speakers guest of honor and chief guest to the inaugural session of international symposium on law and peace and we can give a big round of applause to all of them to give a uh, warm welcome we extend warm welcome to advocate satish mulak ji president pune district bar association and all members of bar association of various states who are participating in this symposium we wholeheartedly welcome unesco chair holder professor dr vishnu dikarat sir founder and chief patron mys mit pune and president mit world peace university and creator world largest peace dome please join in welcoming patron and organizing chair shri rahul vikarat sir managing trustee and executive president mys mit and executive president mit world peace university and chief initiator mit school of government founder bharti chhatra sansad national teachers congress national women parliament national conference on media and journalism we also extend heartfelt welcome to shri nani krupani ji and all members of advisory board of mit wpu faculty of law i also extend warm welcome to academic leadership of mit world peace university professor arim chitnis vice chancellor mit wpu pro deans directors heads of schools hearty welcome to all the participants delegates to this online first edition of symposium on law and peace which is organized by mit world peace university pune bharat in association with pune district bar association and through this imperial grandiose majestic islp platform which is created at mit world peace university under the inspiration and guidance of our revered honorable executive president shri rahul v karat sir we are going to witness an international movement to connect legal luminaries with young mind and this social initiative of mit world peace university to a great extent will lead towards heralding law to promote the culture of peace in this first edition of islp international symposium on law and peace in four days time members from legal fraternity for from more than 17 countries will be sharing their perspective and will be deliberating on role of law to promote the culture of peace more than 88 distinguished speakers from india and abroad will discuss and exchange views across seven technical session there's one youth to youth connect session more than 17 countries representation are there on various technical sessions of islp we extend special welcome to all distinguished speakers from usa turkey china malaysia netherlands south korea brazil new zealand hong kong germany nigeria colombia seychelles guana sri lanka rwanda and of course welcome to all distinguished speakers and panelists from bharat 
Today on December 14, 2021, we are inaugurating this four-day online international symposium. And on December 17, symposium will be concluded with valedictory session. The global society at large is going to benefit from this symposium as the symposium roots are grounded in heralding law to promote peace. I wish to share here that the venue for this symposium is very thoughtfully and purposefully selected as the world largest peace dome, which is at Loni campus Pune. Uh, due to pandemic, MITWPU is hosting first ISLP as an online event. And it is equally important to share that there's a common message and philosophy when it comes to world largest peace dome, MITWPU's International Symposium on Law and Peace. Our revered Professor Dr. Vishnuadi Karat sir's life mission is to establish the culture of peace in the world and deliverance of value-based universal education and which are embodied in the establishment of World Peace Prayer Hall and World Peace Library. And the philosophy of World Largest Peace Dome and the theme of this new and unique initiative, International Symposium on Law and Peace, they're correlated as they both emphasizes ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, the ultimate state of matter. Once again, on my behalf and on behalf of Honorable President, Professor Dr. Vishnath D. Karat, sir, Honorable Executive President, Sri Rahul D. Karat, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor R.M. Chitna, sir, faculty, staff, and students of MIT World Peace University, I extend hearty welcome to all distinguished speakers and participants to first international symposium on law and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, let's join hands strongly to start a great movement, movement to herald law to promote peace. And this movement with the inaugural session had started at the revered land of Dr. Vishnath Karat, MIT World Peace University, Bharat. And it is going to resonate very high globally through this vibrant and open platform by name MIT WPU ISLP. Welcome once again to one and all to ISLP inaugural session, Legal System, the Foundation for World Peace at MIT World Peace University. Thank you, Vande Matram, Jai Hind. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Andhra Daprasan, Madam, for uh, the welcome address. Thank you very much uh, indeed to set the tone for this very inaugural session of the first international symposium on law and peace. My friends, it is really important that this message, this effort should reach every ear, it should reach every eye, and then it should percolate into every heart who's willing to experience peace. And in order to ensure that this message reaches masses, there is an important tradition that MIT Group of Institution has been following, ringing the bell of peace. I request my technical team to show us the experience of ringing the bell of peace, which will tell us that this entire effort is reaching to the hearts of the masses. Over to you, team. A very, very beautiful photograph. A big round of applause, my friends, as we support this cause. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is how it, uh, it would have been in the offline mode. Unfortunately, because of this pandemic, uh, we are forced to go online. But this is generally uh, the way the tradition is followed. Uh, all the stalwarts, all the dignitaries join their hands for ringing the bell of peace in order to ensure uh, that symbolically that this message is reaching every heart. Now, I would like to request all the dignitaries uh, in this digital, on this digital platform, if they can please put on their cameras so that we can capture a very, very beautiful group photograph uh, so that we can cherish these memories for a lifetime. So I request everyone to please put on their cameras. We would like to capture this picture perfect moment in the format of uh, a screenshot. So I request everyone in the panel to please, please put on their cameras and wear a very, very beautiful smile.
Thank you very much. I hope uh, my technical team would have captured the uh, photograph. Again, it's a very, I would say, new normal that photographs have been taken into the format of screenshot. But nevertheless, I think as far as we are able to talk and we are able to communicate the messages that we want to exchange and ensuring that it reaches our hearts, the technology shouldn't be a trouble. And now it's time when I request my team to share with us yet another important message, the theme itself that is underlying in this international, in, at this international symposium of, on law and peace. What exactly are our objectives? What exactly we are trying to do? Let us experience this message through a film. I request my technical team, if they can please show us a theme film specially made on first international symposium on law and peace. Over to you team. The path towards attainment of peace is always full of hurdles. However, legal deliberations can act as an important scaffolding for the construction of a peaceful culture. The legal fraternity is envisioned to be the harbinger of hope that will lead human beings towards harmony. Law indeed is the means to attain the ultimate goal of peace through amicable dispute settlement and therefore this international symposium has been incepted to herald law to promote peace. The first international symposium on law and peace, which is organized by MIT WPU School of Law, aims to become one of the brightest beacons to herald peace and harmony through the lens of the law. The ISLP strives to provide a common platform to legal professionals, youth, policy planners, thinkers and global society at large, where they can come together for dialogue, open discussions, deliberations and can use the platform to recommend measures to address conflict resolution through peace building processes to promote the culture of peace and harmony for a digitally dynamic and complex society. The main mission of arranging the Symposium on Law and Peace is to promote peace and harmony in global society through lawmaking processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice, equity and good conscience sensitizing budding legal professionals as conflict resolution ambassadors to initiate dialogue between lawyers, judges, policy makers, jurists, academicians, the youth, society and industry about legal dimensions and peace perspectives. Law is there for us when we are there with the law. Let's make the best out of this golden opportunity. Welcome to the first international symposium on law and peace. Thank you very much for that film. And it is now my indeed pleasure and honor to invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor of MIT World Peace University, Professor Dr. R.M. Chitnissar, to kindly share us, share with us, and brief us on the theme of First International Symposium on law and peace. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Dr. Gautam Bapad. Good morning and Namaskar to all who have gathered on this virtual platform for first international symposium of, on law and peace organized by MIT World Peace University, Pune, in association with the Pune District Bar Association. Once again, warm welcome on behalf of Founder President, UNESCO Chair for Peace, revered Dr. Karad Sir, Executive President and Managing Trustee Rahul V. Karad Sir, and all the trustees of Myers and fellow colleague of MIT World Peace University. It is a matter of pride and pleasure for all of us at MIT World Peace University to organize the first international symposium on a unique subject of law and peace. It was possible only because of our founder president, who is Herbinger of Peace Through Holistic Education, Dr. Vishwanath Karad sir, and dynamic and visionary leader, Rahul V. Karad sir, both always focus and address very pertinent and important issue of peace with the help of law. And that's why the main theme of this 
International Symposium of Law and Peace is the role of law to promote the culture of peace, not only in India, but in the entire world. The mission which was set by this going to be annual event, annual symposium would be to promote peace and harmony in global society through lawmaking processes and policy decisions by imbibing the principles of justice, equity, and good conscience. Also, to sensitize budding legal professions as a conflict resolution ambassadors. To initiate dialogue between lawyers, judges, policymakers, jurists, academicians, youth, society, and the industry. About the legal dimensions of peace and other perspectives. It is said that by nature, every human being is peaceful and peace loving. Culture of peace is therefore a basic human nature given by Almighty. But there are various human nature, there are various human forces and factors that disturb the peaceful nature of a human being and make him or her restless, violent, damaging, and sometimes destructive in the end. Those factors could be like poverty, hunger, discrimination, on the basis of caste, creed, color, hatred, over aspirations, competition, and so on. If we, are, if we closely look and observe all such disturbing factors, we will realize that all those factors are man-made, not made by Almighty, not made by nature. Rather, nature has nothing to do with them. Nature keeps us peace-loving and these factors disturb us. And that's why the resolution to all those problems is again in the hands of human beings, in association with the nature. This exactly is imbibed through this particular symposium says that law plays a crucial role in keeping everyone compelled to abide by the rules and regulations which are made for maintaining harmony, equality, protection of human rights, resilience, and peace. If peace is not rightly understood and followed by everyone, the only option remains is that of enacting laws which will ultimately lead to ensuring peace. I'm happy that over the next four days, we will witness useful discussions and fruitful deliberations of the renowned experts from all over the world, 17 plus countries. We at MIT World Peace University are glad to have organized this significant symposium to discuss a very crucial and vital issue of today's world, which is full of unrest uncertainty and disturbance. In fact, peace is not only in our name, it is in our genes at MIT World Peace University. And as a responsible academic institution, we preach as well as we teach peace, peace in mind, peace in society, peace in the nation and peace in the world. To conclude, let's all affirm today that bringing and maintaining peace is our first and foremost duty. And let us begin to discharge the duty through this symposium of thoughts and views. Thank you very much. Welcome to you once again. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, Jai Jagat. Over to Dr. Bapat sir. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor sir. Thank you very much uh, for uh, indeed important message that by nature, we all love peace and we all strive to have peace, but let us find the processes and procedure from the lens of law in this international symposium on law and peace. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much once again. And now it is indeed my honor and privilege to welcome the special guest of honor of this session. I, before I invite 
the former judge of Supreme Court of India and former chairman of Competition Appellate Tribunal, Justice retired Dr. Arijit Basayati to address the gathering. I would like to request my technical team if they can please relay a small film made on life and work of the special guest of honor of this session, Justice retired Dr. Arijit Basayati. Over to you, technical team. Justice Dr. Arijit Basayat was born on 10th May 1944. He is eminent jurist. He is presently vice chairman of SIT. Justice Dr. Arijit Basayat had a brilliant academic career. Excelling in almost every academic examination, he appeared. After graduation with honors in English, he obtained LLB from MS Law College, Katak, securing first rank. He was appointed as an additional judge of the Odisha High Court in 1989 and a permanent judge of that court in 1990. He was transferred as Chief Justice at Delhi High Court. Then he was elevated as Judge of the Supreme Court. He has delivered more than 2,500 reported judgments, which is a world record for all Supreme Courts in the world. He was awarded a doctorate in law by Utkal University Bhuvaneshwar and degree of LLD, Honoris Causa by Fakir Mohan University, Balasore and Northern Orissa University, Baripada. We warmly welcome Justice Dr. Arijit Pasayat. Indeed, it is our honor and privilege, sir, to have you here today. Thank you, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being here on this very important platform, the first international symposium on law and peace. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I must congratulate the architects and the conceptualizations of this unique event, uh, the first International Symposium on Law and Peace. Significantly, it is started, as we all say in India, Every good thing starts with Lord Ganesha's prayer. And MIT World Peace University is situated at Pune, which is the seat of Lord Ganapati. In fact, my first visit of Pune was a part of my trip to Ashtavinayak over the state of Maharashtra. And the theme that you have chosen is something which is very timely. Law and peace. The establishment and maintenance of a comprehensive peace through law, rather than by arbitrary violence and coercion, is today commonly regarded as one of human kind's most urgent and difficult problems. To achieve a productive understanding of what law may contribute to peace, of the inextricable interrelations of law and peace, it is necessary that we observe the larger concept of, larger context of global processes of interaction that contain and condition both law and peace. Note the inadequacies in our inherited theories and procedures designed to serve peace and finally apply to the general problem and numerous particular problems of promoting peace, certain relevant intellectual tasks. These tasks extending beyond the unsystematic anecdotal pursuit of random strategies in effective power or the traditional logic, logical derivation from allegedly autonomous legal issues include the postulation and clarification of basic community goals, the examination of past trends in the achievement of such goals, the exploration of the factors that affect degrees in achievement the projection of possible features and the recommendation of alternative to decision process and particular decisions that 
promise a higher degree of success. In realistic perspective, it can be observed that the whole of human, humankind today constitutes a single comprehensive community, entirely comparable to its many internal, territorial, and other communities in the sense of the interdeterminacy or interdependence in the shaping and abasing of all values, sharing of all values. This larger community is composed not merely of an agreement of nation states, but of expanding billions of individual human beings who create, in addition to national nation states, a whole host of other groupings and associations. The Charter of the United Nations states that one of the purposes of the United Nations is to, I quote, bring about by peaceful means and in conformity and principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situations which might lead to a breach of peace, unquote. The rule of law ensures that international law and the principles of justice apply equally to all states and are equally adhered to respect for the rule of law generates an enabling environment for achieving the purposes of this charter. The charter provides the normative basis for friendly relations between states. Together with the wider body of international law, it provides a structure for the conduct of international relations. It creates reciprocity between states as sovereign equals, accords multilateral system and provides a means to resolve disputes arising. Of particular importance to peace and security are the principles of territorial integrity, non-use of threat or force in any manner inconsistent with the charter, and the commitment to interpretation of international legal obligations. Article 33 of the chapter is very critical for the prevention of conflict and the peaceful settlement of disputes. Parties to an international dispute have access to diverse measures and mechanisms for dispute resolution, including negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, and resort to regional agencies or arrangements. A strong rule of law, which protects human rights, helps prevent and mitigate violent crime and conflict by providing legitimate, legitimate processes for the resolution of grievances and the disincentives for crime and violence. Conversely, weak economic development in inequality can be a trigger for crime and violence in this context, the principle of the responsibility to protect adopted by the General Assembly in the 2005 World Summit outcome is relevant. It highlights the importance of supporting national rule of law and human rights institutions to ensure that governments have all the tools necessary to comply with the obligations to protect their populations from genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and ethnic cleansing and calls upon the international community to support such efforts. In situations of armed conflict, the protection of civili civilians is a United Nations priority. Any protection activity, be it physical, political, or through the establishment of a protective environment, must be based on the rule of law and aims to give the applicable laws practical relevance in difficult circumstances. Establishing rule of law institutions is vital to ensuring immediate security and necessary stability for peace building to take root. Strong justice and corrections institutions, together with accountable police and law enforcement agencies, which fully respect human rights, are critical for restoring peace and security in the immediate post-conflict period. Some of the greatest challenges to peace and security are crimes, which while committed on national territory, 
permeates national borders and affect entire regions and ultimately the international community as a whole. This is an evolving challenge for the rule of law and the protection of human rights and illustrates well that strong linkage, linkage with peace and security. With these words, I hope that your deliberation in the coming three days will be of immense help, will contribute for world peace. And the, before saying Ogma, I must say that the architects of this MIT World Peace University deserve to be lauded for naming their university on something which is so dear to every human being, peace and peace worldwide. And therefore, this first international symposium on law and practice in cricketing terms would be the first over of T20 cricket, which is the craze now of all youngsters. And I think uh, most of you also are uh, ardent followers of cricket. And Pune has been a hunting ground for cricketers, I know, Bombay, Maharashtra, that way. The, the new year is coming shortly. My prayer to the Almighty Lord Ganpati is that 2022 becomes a year of peace and happiness for all citizens globally. Thank you. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity to be admitted to today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, indeed. It was really a treat uh, to hear to your views. And indeed, as you rightly mentioned, it is uh, the need of the hour that we uh, look into ourselves and uh, take this message forward. Thank you very much, sir, indeed, for being part of this uh, for inaugural session of International Symposium on Law and Peace. It was indeed our honor and privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, thank please, you. please do visit our institution someday, sir. It is a pleasure to have you I, I'll do that. online board. And you see, you see, as a matter of fact, I am missing my trips to Pune as a part of my visit to Astavinay because I start from Pune, uh, which I have done for more than 20 times. That uh, in the last about the 40 years, I have been 20 times I have gone for Astavinay and starting with Pune. Great, sir. Great, sir. There is such a like mindedness with our founder, Revere Dr. Karat, sir. I think you will have a great company when you come here. I'm so Certainly, thankful. I, I'll be happy to have Dr. Karat with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, sir. Indeed, uh, it was an honor. My friends, it is really important for all of us to keep uh, thinking about these issues which are directly relevant uh, to our society, to our country as whole. Well. And here we have a person who has been thinking on these lines for more than a decade now. A person who created the first school of India, first school of Bharat uh, for political leadership, a mighty school of government. My friends, it was time almost a decade ago that when he thought that we should have uh, similarly on the lines of school of engineering, school of management, school of law, why we cannot have a school that create future political leaders for Bharat, for our motherland. This thought, with this thought, he created the first school of India, probably Asia, for political leadership, MIT School of Government. And this school, over the period of time, gave birth to many such innovative platforms and movements like Bharatiya Chhatra Sansar, National Teachers Congress, National Women's Parliament, World Health Parliament, National Conference on Media and Journalism, and a very, very rooted conference or platform of Sarpanch Sansar. It is indeed my honor and privilege to welcome the Managing Trustee and Executive President of Myers MIT and Executive President of MIT World Peace University and Chief Initiator of MIT School of Government to address the gathering and brief all of us on the concept and vision of First International Symposium on Law and Peace. Before I invite Sri Rahul V. Karat, 
I would like to request my technical team if they can please relay a small film made on life and work of our own executive president, sir. Over to you, team. A good idea is 10% inspiration and 90% implementation. A reflection of this is the multifaceted managing trustee and executive president, MIT World Peace University, Rahul Karad. Rahul Karad, a motivation for the youth, a perspective for the commoners, a guide for dreamers. He has been a pioneer in many of the initiatives conducted by MIT WPU. Rahul is a man with excellent vision and clear thought processes in each and every issue. May it be student politics, justice, democracy or history. A Harvard alumni, he started his journey as executive director of MIT Pune in 2001. Single-mindedly focused on advancing the inherited vision and mission of his academician father, Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karad, founder of the Myers MIT Group of Institutions, resulted in a successful expansion of MIT Pune by Rahul Karad. I look at you as a leader in your own area. Please influence those number of other guys who have that sense of belongingness for the country, the mother India. Rahul is known for his very deep-rooted patriotism and was always inspired by the famous quote of Gandhiji, be the change you wish to see in the world. Why no educated Indian parent ever dreams of their children pursuing politics and public life as a serious career option? Rahul Karad, the founder and executive president of MIT School of Government Pune, gave the seed thought of this unique vision. And MIT SOG became the first institution of political education and leadership in India. Haryana, Bihar, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Goa. In this regard, MIT WPU is actively organizing various social initiatives to impact society by germinating the seed thought for social responsibilities within students, women, teachers, political and administrative leaders to the issues relevant to the world. Rahul Karad is the face of New Bharat, the Young Bharat. Indeed, very well said in the movie, uh, I would say the film, the motivation to young Bharat. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being there to guide all of us. It is our honor and privilege to invite you to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bapat, uh, for that wonderful introduction and that beautiful film. It is a big surprise for me. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, behalf of the bodies of trustees and our beloved founder, Reve Dr. Vishwanath Karad, sir, um, the man who created the world's biggest dome in the uh, in the history of mankind for the uh, uh, to just to convey the thought how to unify the science and spirituality uh, behalf of him our uh, very well known another senior leader who is dr lalit basin uh, who is organizing chair and a patron for this very prestigious first international symposium of law and peace um, uh, let me welcome the chief guest of today's function Justice Deepak Mishra Sahab, the former Chief Justice of India. Uh, also, I would like to welcome the another very important guest, uh, the, who are the special guest of honors for today's this uh, symposium, Dr. Arjit Pasayaji, the former Judge, Supreme Court of India, former Chairman, Competition Appellate Tribunal. Also, I wish to welcome Justice Retired Bharat Bhushan Prasunji, Founder Chairman for Prasun Law Associates, former Judge, Punjab and Haryana High Court. I also wish to welcome another special guest of honor, Advocate Heman Batraji, Public Policy Advocate, Vice President, Sark Law. I also wish to welcome our dear friend and the well-wisher of our institution, Dr. Bimal N. Patel, who is associated last so many years with our institution, who is now uh, at a very important position as a member for member designate of Un United Nations International Law Commission. Vice Chancellor for Rashtriya Raksha University, member of National Security Advisory Board of India. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patel, for joining today. Also, I wish to welcome Advocate Basuri Swaraj, Advocate Supreme Court of India, 
um, and definitely Mr. Nani Krupani, who is the chairman of our advisory council uh, of our school of law, all the advisory council board members of uh, the school of law, our vice chancellor, our other member, Dr. Parashar, who took a great effort, uh, Dr. Purnima Inamdar, who is the head of the school of uh, the school of law, uh, and and all all other trustees, staff, students, particularly who are attending this very prestigious first international symposium of law and peace. So already, Dr. Chitnis, you have introduced all the members. Dr. Parashar very beautifully narrated uh, the very theme and objective. But still, I think I must emphasize again, uh, you know, uh, Pasaj ji wanted to go a little early. So I think he uh, shared his mind on law and peace and uh, really commended this very thought process of law and peace unification for the betterment of our country and uh, future of the world. So thank you, Pasaj ji, for your, that wonderful speech. So here, um, just three, four, five points, you know, why this very effort? Again, there are uh, so many other initiatives, this institution we have established in last uh, so many years. Our founder uh, basically sowed the seed of, uh, you know, uh, how to connect all our degree programs with the society was a quest four decades before. When we established this institution, my dear friends, so, uh, you know, I want to say that uh, in 96, the first World Parliament of Science, Religion and Philosophy, we established uh, with the help of students, staff, and uh, further many such endeavors. And, and now the, the, the very creation, the world's biggest dome for the world peace, which was just inaugurated last year, some two years, 18 months before by uh, Honorable Vice President of India, uh, uh, the Venkia Naidu Sahab, and this very unique vision uh, to take this very vision forward there are various ideas, me and my students, staff, we all are working that, uh, uh, you know, uh, recently we conducted one important conference on national conference on media and journalism, how to, how to you, you know, the journalism has a very important role. And in a similar fashion, uh, you know, many such activities we are building up at our center and uh, with our blessings of our founder, Rivia Dr. Vishwanath Karat, sir. In the year 2005, uh, you know, many political parties and that time, the, the, that respective government in the year 2005, all of them, they supported this idea of the first school of India to develop the future politicians by the name of MIT School of Government. And uh, this uh, is now the uh, almost 17 years we are running this institution, my dear friends, and over 500 students have passed out from this school who are working with various political parties. Uh, few have become MLAs also, few have become corporators, Zilla Parishad members in various uh, such uh, areas of uh, public life they are working. And under the aegis of MIT School of Government and MIT World Peace University, further we as, you know, developed uh, in platforms like Bharati Chhatra Sansad, another platform to sensitize the youngsters to get into public life. The educated youth must come in public life. That was our motto. And, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and extending this very thread further the capacity building of teachers. So we established National Teachers Congress, National Women's Parliament for the Women Empowerment, Rashtriya Sarpancha Sansad, very the bottom pyramid of our country, and uh, and various such capacity building programs we are building up at our center. Uh, so you you people may think that this institution, a university, why uh, it is so active in all such areas. Uh, you know, our beloved founder, I must say that he was a petitioner in Supreme Court long back that in Ayodhya, there has to be a model where in the mandir, the biggest mandir of the world, which the, and the, 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 the Prabhu Ramchandra as a symbol of the world peace. And, and, and maybe, you know, some other religions also can be accommodated. And many such ideas, other people also shared with their mind and vision. But this was very unique vision, which he that time he shared. And, and we know the uh, recent, uh, this uh, very development in Ayodhya and various um, uh, such uh, you know, the Jammu Kashmir issue by this government and various such issues, I must say. And so how do we connect uh, the, the youngsters, the students with the society so that they truly become the active citizen? That is a quest of this nation. And that is a very DNA which has imbibed by our founder, Dr. Vishwanath Karad, my dear friends. And uh, uh, so this very uh, uh, symposium today, uh, what we have planned, uh, I have just few things uh, to say here that uh, the, the executive, judiciary, uh, and uh, legislature, of course, the lawmaking body. So, so these are the very important uh, bodies of our democracy, the, the lawmaking body is the legislature, the executive, execu executing body is the uh, executive wing, 
And of course, uh, if there are any hurdles, the judiciary plays a role uh, where the conflict resolution takes place and uh, the justice is given to the people. And uh, it was little backlog, uh, I must say, that uh, many institutions started school of law long back, but uh, we have established our school of law uh, just uh, three years before. And uh, we felt that uh, now, uh, with the help of the staff and the students, we must establish one such important conference, which will help this particular law school and uh, not just a law school, but the World Peace University vision and overall, you know, the, the ecosystem of our country, Bharat, uh, where we can truly make an impact uh, through this exercise of, uh, uh, you know, conducting such important conference. So just three, four, five points, the 75 years of independence, my dear friends, uh, we all know that uh, Britishers have gone long back, the colonial mindset, how do we deal with it? We are working on that mission also. Can we belong back? Uh, I, I said in last six months, I'm saying many a times this, that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, long back Mumbai was, uh, we started saying Bombay to Mumbai and Madras to Chennai and Bangalore to Bengaluru or many such other names we have changed. And as a part of this journey, I, I'm saying that India, uh, 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 which is a Bharat in the constitution itself, it starts the, uh, the, the very first sentence. But my feeling is, in a day-to-day -day language, can we truly say Bharat? How do we, uh, you know, so, so which can give a true sense of belongingness with our country? That is my personal feeling, my dear friends. And I, I'm, I'm sharing this in front of this very important luminaries, all the uh, lawyers to think over it, that how do we promote so that uh, true innovations? Uh, are we not the original thinkers, my dear friends? Or are we just cut, copy, paste, and we look at the Western world and say that they are the great and we are little inferior? So how do we really change this mindset and, and another one thought I want to share here that Independence Day, you know, long back Britishers left, they have given independence to us. Who are they to give independence? You know, are we, we are such a self-liberated country from so thousands of years. We are such a great history and uh, such a great legacy, my dear friends. So okay, instead of saying Independence Day, can we say a national day? I don't know. I have written the latest to all the MLAs in the country, to the, all the member of parliaments, including Honorable Prime Minister that we need to think on these lines. So this law conference is one such where in the, uh, in the Supreme Court, wherever we go, oh my Lord, uh, 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 we say, so instead of that, can we say, sir, some, some new traditions, new changes in the system. So, so that is a basically a thought process uh, for this conference. Uh, justice delayed, justice denied, my dear friends. What do we, so I want really the solution-based approach in the next three, four days. Uh, and all of you have to really think and guide us that uh, how do we uh, really uh, come out with some such recommendations which further which can be communicated to all the law ministries and the central law ministry and all the other members uh, you know we have the uh, you know various such trib, uh, tribunals are there other systems are there but i think we really need to think my dear friend the quasi judicial quasi judicial system whether we have to really truly empower uh, such systems in a better manner uh, you know, the various arbitration courts we have in the country, as we know, various, uh, so whether can we, can we, uh, you know, uh, have a little more number uh, to, uh, in this direction, can we think to scale up so that uh, we can really, uh, you know, uh, uh, give the justice a little faster. Uh, so impact-based justice, here I'm writing about the progressive legislation. How do we really create, you know, the one guy, do, uh, uh, you know, some uh, theft of 10,000 or 10 crore. How do we really give the impact-based justice? There are other changes definitely coming in this direction, but I feel we have to have a progressive legislation and you guys are the competent people to think on this. I don't know whether here I want to also say the compassion for the judges. How, can, can, can there be a little such uh, empowerment where the compassion can be really uh, you know, such uh, authority can be given to the judges on the compassionate ground. They can really, uh, you know, uh, make their decisions. I don't know. So, 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 but I want students and everybody, all of us to think that the time has come that we have to truly reform the, the, the British old system. Uh, we are following many such uh, Indian penal codes and various such ideas, but I think, and, and very fundamental as active citizen, I see very simple things, but how come we haven't changed? That is the question which I ask myself. What are those hurdles? What are those challenges? You, you people know better, my dear friends. So, so here also I want to say whether it is a controversial or how people will look at, but I feel the, 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 the judges promotions and various such activities, our social system, can we have this purely on the wisdom basis or merit basis? 
you know, we, we, we really need to think because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the merit is uh, very important in every field. Uh, and we have a lot of history, a lot of history baggage is there. So, but, but, but we all have to really think that the promotions of the judges can we have, uh, on our, you know, instead of on the social system, can we think on the wisdom and the merit? Um, the, you know, I, I, I also wish to say here, some of those questions just I'm throwing, my dear friends, that uh, how do we create the environment of trust, faith in our legal system? Um, and, and for that, me as an educationist, my feeling is um, there are so many retired judges, so many lawyers in the country. Can we have one depository, the HRD ministry, the education ministry, and they work together and we have a compulsory such module imparted to uh, all the graduate, undergraduate, postgraduate students, maybe uh, one or two days as active citizens. Uh, I too feel that it should be given to every citizen, but our system is so huge. Our population is such a, uh, you know, important uh, issue on which we should need a separate debate. But, but again, dealing with such a large system, uh, I think, and for that active citizenship, some modules can be given by the education ministry itself, a compulsory module so that we become little educated and and and, and then I think uh, uh, many things can be resolved. The use of technology for the faster faster decision making, can we think of uh, how do we really use uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, the AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and so many other things in our judicial setup so that we can really give a justice little faster. So, so, so I think I have covered uh, some of those points just for our stimulation and, 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 and overall thinking. Uh, Sometimes also we have to think whether system overshadows the justice. That is also one important thing, my dear friends. We all have to really think and uh, you are the best people. I forgot to take lastly the name of Advocate Satish Mulikji. Your institution has supported this. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I have covered uh, many points. So once again, uh, I say thank you so much, Lalit Basin Sahab that your blessings and support. You are an institution by yourself. Uh, the, the Law Association of India, the, the various such uh, the law firms association you established long back. Thanks to Mr. Rupani, he became instrumental to introduce to you. And uh, many good things we can do, sir. And uh, this is the first such endeavor because of the pandemic and uncertainties we planned through this online medium. But someday, uh, maybe next year, we conduct the huge such convention of some two, 3,000 lawyers of the country that in the world biggest dome, the world peace dome, and, and truly this message of peace, we can communicate to the world uh, from this center of MIT World Peace University. Thank you so much once again, Lalit Basinji and all the other advisory board members, Anik Rupaniji and everyone for helping us to organize this very important and institutionalizing this platform for the first uh, international symposium of law and peace. Thank you so much. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for welcoming Elaborating the concept of uh, uh, behind the thought behind International Symposium on Law and Peace. Indeed, a very, very important thought. And congratulations and thank you very much for giving birth, I would say, to this very, very important platform in the country. And I'm sure just on the lines of Bharatiya Chandra Sansad, this platform as well uh, would prove to be a very, very important platform for Bharat, of, for our motherland. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your guidance and support as always. Thank you, sir. It is indeed uh, my honor and privilege uh, to invite the special guest of honor in this session now, who is the advocate at Supreme Court of India, Advocate Basuri Swarajji. But before I invite her to address the gathering, I would like to request my technical team if they can please relay a small film made on life and work of Advocate Basuri Swarajji. <laughs> Ms. Bansuri Swaraj is an Indian-based lawyer. She has been practicing law since 2007. She used to handle criminal, civil, tax, commercial and constitutional types of cases. Ms. Bansuri Swaraj used to practice in the Supreme Court and Delhi High Court. Till date, she has fought for many individuals and multinational companies. Ms. Bansuri Swaraj is the daughter of the popular politician Sushma Swaraj and Sri Kaushal Swaraj, an esteemed lawyer and a former governor of Mizoram. She was born and brought up in the capital of India, New Delhi. Ms. Bansuri Swaraj completed her secondary and primary stages of education from her hometown New Delhi and for further education she moved to England where she studied law from Oxford University. Ms. Bansuri Swaraj is known for her sharp legal mind and desire to achieve something big. 
we warmly welcome Ms. Basuri Swaraj. We are indeed honored and privileged, ma'am, to have you here today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are all our team to hear your views. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, we can't hear you, ma'am. I think you're on mute. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction. And I'm very grateful for this invite. I'm delighted to be part of today's symposium on such a pertinent uh, topic. I begin by first of all congratulating the MIT World Peace University. I was keenly listening to everything that Mr. Karad has said about the amazing work and the thought and the ideology that you are propagating uh, for the betterment of Bharat. And uh, may Bharat, Ma Bharati always bless this institute to grow from strength to strength each day. Um, just beginning and taking up the mantle of uh, where uh, Honorable Justice Pasayat said, um, I would just like to say that, first of all, uh, Rahul Karadji, Dr. Vishwanath Karadji, Honorable Justice Pasayat, Honorable Justice Deepak Mishra Sahab, Justice uh, Prasoon, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to build on what uh, Justice Pasayat had said, and he spoke about the importance of rule of law and how whenever rule of law is violated, the society descends into chaos. Now, I will begin by perhaps dissenting with Dr. Chitnis for a minute. He said that man is a peaceful uh, animal and that the conflicts are basically man-made. Nature made us very peaceful. But I believe that conflict is inherent in our nature. I believe that animal laws of nature are actually ruthless and only work towards the survival of the strongest. It is the rule of law that distinguishes a civilized human being from a mere animal existence. So when a group of homo sapiens come together and agree to abide by a certain code of conduct, there germinates the possibility of a peaceful civilization. This agreed code of conduct, which is in the form of restrictions or mandatory directions or impositions of duties, is what we call rule of law. Or taking a leaf out of what Mr. Karad, Mr. Rahul Karad was saying in the ancient terms, rule of law in Bharat is defined as dharma. Now, Dr. Karad was also, sorry, Rahul Karadji was also talking about how we can break away from the colonial mindset. This is so important because, you know, Western scholars will have you believe that the Magna Carta is the foundation of modern day common law. But I personally believe that our own sacred texts, such as the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, they teach us the rule of law and how important dharma is to maintain peaceful civilization long before that the Magna Carta came into existence. When the entire world was drowning in an ancient flood, our texts tell us that Lord Vishnu took the Matsya Avatar and saved our Vedas and the Saptarishis. These Vedas were the code of conduct on which new civilization could be established. Further, every time there has been a diversion or derogation from the rule of law or dharma, there has been conflict in society resulting in a large scale destruction. Our history tells us that every time mankind has diverted from dharma, aka rule of law, God himself had to ensure that the course of civilization was corrected. Whether it is Narsim who had to come and destroy Hiranyakasya, or Bhagwan Parshuram who had to destroy the corrupt rulers time and again, we have been told that the rule of law, if it is not followed, then society suffers and ends up in conflict. The Great War of Mahabharat was known as the Grand Dharma Yudh, right? It was the Yudh of rule of law. On one hand, we had Duryodhan who did not follow any rules or laws to the, to the extent that he ordered the disrobing of Devi Draupadi, his elder brother's wife. When the rulers themselves were misbehaving in such a manner, the society itself had fallen into a state of lawlessness. In order to rectify the state of lawlessness, this state of anarchy, the great war of Mahabharat was fought so that the rule of law or dharma could be established. Such is the importance of dharma in Bharat that God himself was bound by it and had to uphold him. 
if you one reading of the Ramayana will show why Lord Ram is referred to in Malala Pesha. Because he takes the needs of his people before the needs of himself as a king. And he upheld the law of the land time and again. Now, moving forward to modern times. Let's look at the modern times. War, I believe, is a consequence of conflict. And it does not lead to any resolution. I would like to quote my mother here. She said in the House of Parliament, she said ki, that she actually said that war is, does not lead to any resolution, only dialogue leads to some kind of resolution. I strongly believe that war creates a vicious cycle of war sowing the seeds of further future conflicts. Just take a look at world history. After the First World War, society did not wise enough and then descended into chaos of the Second World War. One of the primary reasons of these wars was that there existed no system of law to govern the relationship between nations. There was no law or mechanism to punish a powerful, aggressive nation and to protect a weak one. There was nothing to prevent these nations from colonizing and exploiting different parts of the world and then fighting over these colonies for their own personal greed. Bharat herself has suffered over 200 years of colonization. It is only after these wars that the United Nations was established and certain laws were enacted to first attempt a peaceful, amicable resolution of disputes and fun to punish the aggressors and protect the weak. Let's take a look at Article 1 of the Charter of the United Nations, which states that the purpose of the United Nations is to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes, or situations which might lead to a breach of peace. International courts were established to help the countries to deal with their legal disputes and also to punish war criminals and prevent heinous crimes like genocide. Most importantly, basic human rights were acknowledged and laws were formulated to protect people and countries from enslavement and colonization. Today, a nation does not need to wage war through weapons. It can utilize an established legal framework, such as the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court to resolve a dispute. One such example is, of course, the case of Lieutenant Colonel Jadha, an Indian citizen, an Indian citizen who had been kidnapped by Pakistan and sentenced to death without any proper trial or access to legal defense. India, instead of taking recourse to a military action, chose to invoke the jurisdiction of the ICJ. India managed to prevent the unlawful execution of its citizen and give him a chance to defend his case. Now, Rahulji also spoke about Ayodhya. So I would like to touch upon that as well. That national courts, closer to whom the Honorable Supreme Court of India and high courts are the guardians of rule of law in our country. And time and again, the courts have stepped up to the situation and resolved major conflicts in Indian society. And as Rahul Jain pointed out, Ayodhya is one such example. The judgment which was delivered by the Honorable Supreme Court of India in relation to the legal dispute over the Ayodhya Ram Janmabhumi site. I'd just like to quote two paragraphs from the judgment to show how the judiciary stepped in and the rule of law was upheld to eradicate this conflict which was, which was marring our society for over th for three decades. While concluding the matter at para 1233, it was stated, this court as the final arbiter must preserve the sense of balance that the beliefs of one citizen do not interfere with or dominate the freedoms and beliefs of another. While acknowledging Hindu inherent rights over Ram Janmabhumi, the court in para 1238 said, the allotment of and respect of the possessory claims of the Hindus to the composite hold of the disputed property stands on a better footing than the evidence adduced by the Muslims. On the other hand, the court also provided relief to the Vakhs board. In the same paragraph, by, by observing, 
Justice would not prevail if the court were to overlook the entitlement of the Muslims who have been deprived of the structure of the mosque through means which should not have been employed in a secular nation committed to the rule of law. And of course, there was a balancing of scales which the Supreme Court did. I would like to say that the rule of law or dharm is a cornerstone of peace in human civilization. And that is why in order to remind us of this quintessential truth, you will see an inscription of a motto in every courtroom in the Supreme Court, which reads, Yato dharmas tato jaya, which means where there is dharm, it is always on the side of victory. So let me end my speech today by reading the entire full shlok before you. Yato dharma, yato krishna tato dharma, yato dharma tato jaya, which means where there is Krishna, there is dharma, and where there is dharma, there is victory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Swaraj, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, Bidi Karat, sir, Rahul Karat, sir, if you would like to express. Thank you. Thank you, my advocate Swaraj. I'm so glad to see you today morning. I just wish to say a small little memory, madam. I met uh, uh, Honorable Sushma ji uh, three, four occasions, and she supported this very idea of political leadership school long back interacted with various my previous batches of MIT School of Government. Uh, someday I wish you to come to city of Pune. And uh, this is my standing invitation that you please do visit Thank you. one of the world monument, the World Peace Dome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Indeed, uh, it was honor and privilege, ma'am, to hear your views. Yato Dharma Tato Jaya. And indeed, a very apt, uh, I would say, analogies that you put forth in front of everyone in the audience with the reference of Mahabharata and Indian mythology. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I would like to share with you that it has been the constant endeavor of Revere Post, Dr. Vishwanath Karat, sir, to make all of us understand what is dharma, what is our duty, and if we perform our duties, there would be jaya. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for underlining that thought once again. It was really our honor and privilege to have you here today. I would request my technical team to please share, please give a big round of applause uh, because we are on this technical platform, so that's the only way uh, we can do it. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, ma'am. Thank you very much. It was really a privilege uh, to hear your views. Thank you very much. My friends, it is now time when I move ahead with the special guest of honor for this very important session the Senior Advocate of Supreme Court of India and former Judge of Punjab and Haryana High Court, a person who has done PhD in law from University of Punjab, Chandigarh. It is my honor and privilege to invite Justice Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasunji. But before I invite him to address the gathering, I would like to request my technical team, if they can please relay a small film made on life and work of Justice Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasunji. Justice Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasoon is a designated senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India. He has also served as a judge in Punjab and Haryana High Court. Justice Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasoon has done LNB from Punjab University, Chandigarh and LLM from Nagpur University, Nagpur. He has also achieved PhD in Management Studies, PhD in Computer Science and Applications, and PhD in Journalism and Mass Communication from Kurukshetra University, Kurukshetra. During the judicial career spanning over 35 years, the undersigned has discharged judicial functions on all jurisdictions such as civil law, criminal law, labor laws, banking laws, commercial laws, taxation laws, company law, family law, and land law. He has been a resource person for the National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, as also for Chandigarh Judicial Academy, Chandigarh. He has been a life member of the Indian Institute of Criminology, Chennai, and also a fellow of the Indian Council of Arbitration, New Delhi. We warmly welcome Justice Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasood. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed our honor and privilege to have you here today, sir. Over to you, sir.
Sir, can you please? Good morning, me? everyone. Yeah. First of all, I pay my regards and bow before the teaching community, this university, and all the distinguished speakers who are also my teachers, one way or the other, from the tradition of Eklavya to Dronacharya. And as was that the yeah. first mode of distant learning from the same concept, I also deal with all present here and with respect. Bowing myself to them, I regard them as my makers and makers of every youth in the country to make nation a real force to reckon with and working for the international peace wherever they are. Teachers, wherever they are, they are teachers and must be respected with the veneration they deserve. Moving further, I must thank this university for providing me opportunity to speak and must congratulate them with this spirit with which they have come for this <coughs> grand international symposium on law and peace. Law, peace, law courts, administration of justice, judicial administration, and international peace, all are interrelated subjects which have their intertwined existence like concentric circles. It must be taken note of that right from the advent of human civilization, these homo sapiens as we are, we found ourselves, though in heart of hearts, wanting peace, harmony, happiness, equanimity, poise, equilibrium, but by nature, every man is aggressive, possessive, and this bent of mind, this behavioral impact to possess more and more, and one upmanship either in knowledge or worldly possessions or power, or even wealth, affluence, this created tensions, conflicts, as also turmoils within the society, without the society, in small peripheral societies, or even in the center, in the core section, or at the state level, national level, or even at the international level. If you ask anyone, no one will say that he wants violence, aggression, turmoil, anxiety. No one. But everyone at one point of time or the other has been after possession, more and more, and that practically leads to more materialistic upliftment of the society as well, but at the same time, tensions. If we see from the practical aspect of view, peace also can be taken to be peace of cremation ground, Peace of development, upliftment, progress, touching the zenith of glory of every field. Peace at home, peace, which is mental peace inside and peace outside. Inner peace depicts your communion with God, superpowers, internalizing yourself, 
and peace outside also forms the milieu in which man lives. If peace outside is a threat, peace inside cannot be there. It may be said, मोम का घर बनाने में मशगूल हूं चारों जानब से जलते हुए शहर में इफ वी गो ऑन द इंटरनेशनल फेस्टिवल हैंस कैंसर वॉज द फर्स्ट प्रोबेबली द ऑथर हु रोट पीस थ्रू लॉस इन 1944 ही वॉज वेरी कैटेगोरिकल पीस एंड कमिटमेंट to international laws and legal institutions was necessary then after granville clark lois b son spoke of world peace through world law this was in 1958 but in between many things happened 1945 united nations after the holocaust the destruction the human mankind having suffered came the united nations thereafter in 1948 we saw universal declaration of human rights the pain pangs and destruction made the nations to think to cogitate and debate and they came to the conclusion that world peace can't be brought by aggression by violence by coercion but by coexistence harmonious peaceful and caring for each other in shared standards of unified existence from that angle the question came how to create legal systems which support peace and universal declaration of human rights was first such a declaration of shared standards of concomitant coexistence whereby everyone wherever he is irrespective of the territorial jurisdiction of the countries was a human being and was endowed with certain human rights and those human rights must be exercised taken care of and duly respected if we go by the preamble of the universal declaration of human rights i quote two sentences it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression that human rights should be protected by rule of law speakers earlier has spoken about rule of law about rights about duties and about the international order we in this world need to be very positive focused and firm i was speaking about world peace to world law in 1958 this thesis was adopted propounded and propagated by two authors clark and sohan this even spoke of world conciliation board a world equity tribunal compulsory jurisdiction for indian for icj international court of justice transfer of primary responsibility for the maintenance of peace from the security council to the general assembly world disarmament enforced by regional courts so even now today we do hear such voice echoing in the corridors of the international courts as well as in the peace fora wherever those discussions are made the form of security council the value of conciliation in international law treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons fragmentation of international law in specialized sub fields like trade law human rights law peace law but these specialized fields would only bring the technical aspects of it and fragmentation of world peace would be there that is not the approach we need to have a holistic approach a uh, approach which is at 360 degree angle and every aspect of it is taken into consideration human being has certain rights 
which are available to him merely because he is a human being and he needs to be protected in that if we see the genetic code of law we find that the dna of law speaks of law having been born out of the premise of force we had the earlier possessions either of slaves or of land or of animals and then these concretized into recognized possession by customary law which later converted into legal systems legal systems which were legislated legal systems which were declared legal systems which were bylaws rules regulations and what not and everything included therein even if we see at the national front we the people of india gave this constitution which is the constitution of india to ourselves on 26th of november 1949 we see that much of the human rights which are there in the universal declaration of human rights adopted by the general assembly in 1948 on 10th of december are translated into fundamental rights which are enforceable even against the might of the state and see earlier these societies had the feeling of conciliation good governance within the society and people used to do their disputes settled among themselves when boy saw the constitution of india this grand not grand document every every law is tested on this litmus test in its validity legality and enforceability when in constituent assembly at the time of drafting of the constitution the question was raised that what was the most important fundamental right then dr bhim rao ambedkar said if we see article 32 that is the right to judicial remedies that is probably the last resort and the first resort also because without this right the enforceability of law would not come and enforceability in a law is most important because without remedy without enforceability law would be of no application in india we have seen many progressive strains even when a particular human right was not able to cater to a particular need then the theory of emanation the theory of arising out of that particular right many more multiple proliferated laws that was recognized in india we had a very dynamic and uh, even now during the covid times indian judiciary responded to the under privileged the laborers and many more where they could provide succor and sustenance which came as support and strength to the teeming millions and from that angle even on the front of nation state city everywhere the legal writ which was basically the consent of the people because people wanted that everyone should be protected state wanted that everyone should be protected but at the same time at times there are certain difficulties and certain infirmities even with all these infirmities one cannot think of a society an organized state an organized society to be without any legal system legal system is basically the protector the support even you are at home the first unit of society that is the family the law which mother gives you in the lap that is the compassion and that is law the father's parent hood whereby he gives the command or takes the pe- they take the members of the family in a con- confidence that is law that is conformity with certain principles of universal application they within the family and indian family particularly is the teaching ground for the first lessons of law in the house which ultimately are raised to the principles of good governance wherever one is but principles of good following for 
a general application. C, even the anatomy of a virgin biological terms, if it is desystematized or deregularized, we fall ill. Even in the nature, C, sun rises in the east and then sets up. Thereafter, the night comes, the discipline is maintained. Think of a day when sun forgets to rise. It can't happen. And that is what is the orderly society. Any right, any system, or any particular community, be it at the tiny level or be it at the large level, has to remain a discipline. That is why it is said even about the rights, that rights to be effectively possessed need to be under control and basically to be regulated, superintendent, and uh, fully proceduralized. That is the functional aspect. From that angle, we have to see that uh, shared standards of yardsticks of protection of rights, that is basically judicialization of peace. Peace is the ultimate aim, be it a man, be it a family, be it a community, be it a state, or be it a nation, or be it the international globe. Now see, in this digital world, we have been reduced to a dot. Technology has taken its place. We are in, in information era. We are a knowledge society. Territorial geographies have given way to traffic in internet. And uh, we have become netizens. From citizens, we have to switch over to netizens. And here, the geographical entities or the territorial entities basically do not come. And we need to go further, support, sustain, and synchronize. And the coming world, we are finding that even this digital uh, era it is going to create tensions in the nature of data privacy, surveillance, digital security, internet impact, innovations, technological changes, all these, and even human trafficking, refugee crisis, gender inequality, nationalism, even which even at times threatens right to life, food, health, if it is barbarism and paraculism, attack on media and spread of misinformation, fake news, human rights suffer, fundamental rights suffer. And whenever truth and access to information is endangered, there's their position that we also come under surveillance attack. But in our particular Indian context, I must say that we are 20 or 30 years ahead of times. Even in the adversity of COVID-19, we had the challenges, opportunities, which our government in power or the society in existence, everywhere it's supported and sustained. Every man is endeavoring to be higher on the zenith. And the cooperation, support, coordination, that always leads to world peace, peace at home, peace at family. And we must support everywhere. Peace comes through coordination. Alternative dispute redressal mechanism is one such yarn, whereby we achieve happiness, profit rate, more of ecstasy, and in Indian context, the field where we go. And thank you very much. Nice of you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Exactly pinpointing the issues that we currently have, and you have also underlined the need of holistic approach uh, towards looking at all these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bharat Bhushan Prasunji, for uh, taking time out and sharing with us all these important issues. And I would say you have given us a vision to look at these problems. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm sure everybody in the audience would be uh, charged and delighted with the thoughts that you have shared with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it is time, my friends, when I invite the patron and the organizing chair of the symposium, the advocate of Supreme Court of India, managing partner of Basin and Company, and the president of the Society of Indian Law Firms and the president of Indian Law Foundation, Honorable Dr. Lalit Basinji. But before I invite him to address the gathering, may I request 
the technical team to kindly relay a small film made on life and work of Dr. Lalit Basinji. Dr. Lalit Basin is a distinguished lawyer with over five decades of law practice. He started his law practice in 1962 and has developed Basin and Co as one of the leading law firms in India. Basin and Co currently maintains offices in New Delhi and Mumbai and has 28 associates. He is an honorary life member of the International Bar Association, chairman of CIARB India, and a member of the ICC Arbitration India Co Group. He is a former president of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association and a former chairman of the Film Certification Appellate Tribunal of India. He was awarded honorary membership of the IBA in Melbourne in 1994 for outstanding service to the legal profession. He was felicitated with a plaque of honor for outstanding contribution to the rule of law in 2002 by the Prime Minister of India and the National Law Day Award in 2007 by the President of India. We warmly welcome Dr. Lalit Bhasin. Indeed it is honor and privilege uh, uh, to invite uh, the chief patron and organizing chair honorable Dr. Lalit Bhasin ji. Over to you sir. Sir, can you please unmute yourself? Thank you for your very gracious introduction. Thank you. Sir. First of all, one must give compliments where they are due. Today's compliments are due to the MIT World Peace University. and in particular to the founder dr vishwanath karan the managing trustee and executive president shri rahul karan all those who have organized this including dr anuradha parasar dr purnima inamdar and the vice chancellor ms dr r m chitnis and their entire team for this unique and historic event which is the first international symposium on law and peace which has been put in place at a time when it was most required we also had the distinguished presence of honorable justice arijit pasayat and also dr bharat bhushan parsoon ji but we also had a young participant advocate bansuri swaraj who gave an excellent presentation we also have with us here the president of the pune bar association mr satish malik and my dear friend and colleague trust mr nanak rupani and all distinguished participants i bring to you greetings from the bar association of india from the society of indian law firms from the chartered institute of arbitrators and other organizations of lawyers the first symposium international symposium is on law and peace now i don't know why the word law has been chosen because i have a different perspective although it is connected with law my view is that emphasis should always be on justice and not on law law is just a part of delivery of justice but justice is the overall umbrella which provides you see to the people of the world a sense of well being a sense of being understood a sense of delivering good to the humanity at large and that is why 
it is very significant to note that in our constitution, the very preamble of the constitution, it does not talk about law. It talks about justice. And just see, I'll read out to you the, the short preamble. The preamble says, we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, so secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens and note this, justice, social, economic and political. Why these words were chosen? It was with the intention, you see, that justice is like a panacea. It legality, it gives justification for all that is good in this world, in this in humanity, you see. Dr. Ambedkar very rightly, you see, made a distinction between justice and law and emphasize that law is just a means to achieve full justice for everyone. Therefore, when we talk about legal systems and world peace, please do not think of law as a part of legal system. It is no doubt, it is an integral part, but supplement it with the word justice, justice and world peace. Justice and world peace is the natural thing to be said, not law and peace. Legal system, you see, will be different in different jurisdictions. In Russia, you may have a different legal system. In China, if have, there will be a different legal system. So in France, you have the civil law, just the legal system. Under the UK, the Commonwealth countries, they have the common law systems. But what is common in all these is the system of adherence to justice, to provide justice to all. That is the end result of all the legal systems in this country, wherever there is a rule of law. Now, what is Justice or what? Dharma. Constitution, they chose these because of the heritage that we have got. Right from our ancient times, we never put emphasis on law. We put emphasis on the justice delivery system. We had a consensual form of justice delivery system, not the adversarial system which we got it from the British. That is where the law came in. Earlier it was all justice and justice and nothing but justice. Our panchayats, they were delivering justice. They were not dealing with law. They were not dealing with te technicalities. And they settled thousands and thousands of cases through mutual consensus. came in the Zilla Parishad, you see the same thing was there. It is only with when the British came in that we had the laws brought in and we have still those some obsolete laws in place. The CPC, you see the IPC, the Indian uh, the, uh, Contract Act of 1800 something, Evidence Act again of 1800 something and all that, those are still in place. Anyway, one has to live with those laws because now they are a part of our constitutional system of uh, governance. But in India, we have always recognized law as nothing but dharma. Dharma means justice, that is nyay, and it explains what is right, what is wrong in a given circumstance. There is a beautiful Sanskrit saying, Dharmo Vishvasya Jagataha Pratishtaha Loke Dharmishtam Praja Up Samar Pantri Dharmen Papam Panudati Dharme Sarvam Pratishtatam Tasma Dharmam Parmam Padanti Dharma constitutes 
the foundation of all affairs in the world. People respect one who adheres to dharma. Dharma insulates man against sinful thoughts and actions. Everything in this world is founded on dharma. Dharma therefore is considered supreme. And what is dharma? Dharma is justice. So that is the emphasis to be given to justice. The since the topic is legal system, I must talk about that also. The role and impact of the legal profession is not limited to the precincts of the courts alone. As an indispensable and respectable member of the society, limited from dharma to the modern modern law from Manu to Cotilla to Privy Council and court, it has been the proud prerogative of the legal thing, a peaceful and an order to achieve the Weberian concept of maximum welfare and peace for the world. This is the message I think what uh, Dr. Vishwanath Karad and Mr. Rahul Karad want to give to the, not only our country, but I think to the world at large. What? Yeah. Therefore, Coming back to what is law, law is the cement of the society. You see, law cements the society and essential medium of change or in understanding social values. Law is proper reasoning of what is good or is harmful to individual or to a group of people. What are the kinds of law? Broadly, laws are divided into two kinds. National law, it regulates the relationship between one person and the other person, between a person with the other person and the person inter se. Second is the international law. That is where we are concerned. It governs the relationships between one state and another state between one state and more than one states and the states inter se. But the essence of all this law is justice. Justice is sine qua non of every legal system. Please bear in mind that justice is sine qua non for all for each and every legal system that exists in the country. It is apparent that the law or the legal rules ought to be just, but often it is not. So justice is, however, simply understood as following the general customs by a judge or a competent authority. Justice is the ultimate aim of every civilized family, society, and nations. An ideal state must provide to its citizens justice, social, economic, and political. That is what is enshrined in our constitution. Justice cannot prevail where there are gross inequalities of wealth, resources, and opportunities. Removal of inequalities in all spheres is the foremost task of any government or any people which respect human dignity of each individual. That is the essence of legal system and that is the essence of how to achieve peace. If you lay emphasis on what is dharma, what is justice, that is if all citizens of the world 
put this emphasis in forefront, then there is no reason why there should not be peace. There is bound to be peace because that is a mindset then. The mindset is to get a proper justice delivery system. And that can be created only by having this fairness. Not what is apparent, what is the law, but bringing change the mindset of the people of the world. That is more important because that ensures peace. If there are all right thinking people in the world, there is no question of any uh, uh, The Indian legal system or any other legal system at a given time is not creation of one man in one day. It represents the cumulative fruit of the endeavor, experience, thoughtful planning, and patient labor of a large number of people through generations and systems of the past. Thus, it is necessary to acquire a basic knowledge of the pattern of growth and development. Therefore, please don't forget your past, the heritage which you have got, the noble heritage, and the best example of legal system and peace is given by none other than our leaders who were lawyers, lawyers in the profession, by getting independence for our country through peaceful means. There was no armed revolt. There was no warfare. There were no wars, but Mahatma Gandhi, you see, got freedom for our country through peaceful means. That is what is peace. And that is how, you see, one can achieve it if there is a proper mindset. Our leaders were there. Mahatma Gandhi, Sardar Patel, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Dr. Ambedkar, they all brought freedom to this country. So our system, legal system, is a, should be treated as a part of a social system. And it should reflect the social, political, economic, and cultural characteristics of the society. A legal system of a nation consists of certain basic principles and values largely outlined by our constitution, a set of operational norms, including rights and duties of citizen spelled out both central and law. The Indian legal system of the ancient Hindu lawgivers, the Muslim rulers, and the need-based system developed by the British before independence. Therefore, my parting message to you is that whatever be the legal system we follow, each country has a different legal system which we follow, but there has to be a real commitment to the rule of law. The rule of law is a sense and the essence of rule of law is dharma, adherence to dharma, that is justice is most important to attain peace through legitimate means. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Dr. Lalit Basiji. Such a beautiful address. And I must say that the way gently you have unfolded the meaning and the difference of sense that we must have, uh, the difference between word law and word justice, the way we should perceive the meaning of both the words, and again, yet you underline the importance of dharma, the duty that we all must perform. Uh, it was indeed a treat to hear to your views. Thank you very much for being the patron and organizing chair of this symposium. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Robert. Uh, Basit Sahab, I'm so thankful that uh, because of uh, your that academic mind, we could really conceive this very important conference. And uh, I look at you as an institution, sir, uh, so many important platforms you have created. You are already chairing such important other platforms in your 
uh, life journey. I think uh, in the law field, in Delhi circles at the national level, international level, what we have achieved, we all feel really proud. And I'm, I'm praying today in front of all my students and everybody that your guidance and support in the future also. In a true institutionalization of this conference, we really wanted to conduct it in a physical form in this the world biggest dome created by our beloved founder, Dr. Karad. You know, so someday, sir, we 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 work together and 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 built up, uh, you know, this uh, uh, the in the physical mode such uh, convention here in city of Pune. Maybe next year itself, as this uh, when we uh, really come out of this all uncertainties, uh, with your support, we can do many good things, sir. I'm really really thankful, Dr. Lalit Basin Sabi. You are a magnetic personality, and whatever those three four interactions we had all the time, you have motivated me, my team. And everybody, and uh, you you come to a level of a person. You you have seen so much, but but always I have seen your style of functioning and uh, motivating all the members, uh, including Dr. Parash. Thank you, Rahul ji. I think we you have initiated a noble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Now it's my honor and privilege to uh, take this session forward with the next special guest of honor who's present here with us today, the member designate of United Nations International Law Commission, the Vice Chancellor of Rashtriya Raksha University and member of National Security Advisory Board of India. The special guest of honor of this session, Honorable Dr. Bimal N. Patelji is here with us. It is indeed our honor and privilege. Before I invite him to address the gathering, I would like to request my technical team to kindly relay a small film made on life and work of Dr. Bimal N. Patel. Professor Dr. Bimal N. Patel is currently the Vice Chancellor of Rashtriya Raksha University and a member National Security Advisory Board of India. Professor Patel obtained his PhD in International Law and LLM from Leiden University and another PhD in International Law from Jaipur National University. Professor Patel is a former international civil servant, scholar and academician of international law and diplomacy. As international law jurist, Professor Patel has extensively studied, researched, commented and published works on the administrative, procedural and substantive jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, among others. Professor Patel is also visiting professor with the University of Nanterre, Paris, fellow at Institute of Air and Space Law, University of Cologne, Germany, Hague Academy of International Law, Xiamen Academy of International Law and International Foundation for the Law of the Sea. We warmly welcome Professor Dr. Bimal N. Patel. Yes, sir, it is indeed our honor and privilege to have you here today, sir. We all are keen to go to you. Over to you, sir. Oh, very good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yes, sir. Please go, ahead, sir. Thank you very much. At the outset, I express my deep gratitude to Dr. Vidhi Karal, Karal and dear friend Rahul Karal and the entire MIT School of Governance the World Peace University for inviting me to give remarks on interconnectedness between law and peace. Friends, law and peace is not a pastime activity, but a sincere mission to be pursued by lawmakers, executives, and interpreters, but as much as peace-loving individuals and institutions from all backgrounds. But also let me tell you, law and peace, both are abstract concepts. In fact, I personally consider Law is a process to keep peace. According to Bhagavad Gita, the enlightened individual 
to be a lawmaker, law teacher, thinks and acts in tune with the fundamental level of existence and the level from which nature is structured. And this is what we call the Vedic ideal of life in accord with natural law. Similarly, if you look back our own Nimansa Sastra and of the Nyaya branch, this Mimansa Sastra explained to us our Vedas in sequence. One of them is the later verses previous rule and its importance for peace. Earlier situations and laws were there to keep peace of the time. But now newer situations and newer laws are required to keep ever evolving concept of peace. I can tell you one personal example. As a member of the Law Commission of India, when I was working for a project of Central Acts of India, I could put together a table and accordingly, since 1834, more than 150 years back, almost 200 years back, till 2019, India has enacted 6,777 laws. How many? 6,777 laws, of which, as of October 2019, 2,404 central acts were partially or fully in force and remaining were repeated. Because those laws were outdated, obsolete, and they were not serving the purpose of the ever evolving society of India. And the new laws are brought because the lawmakers believe that these new laws are better suited to the contemporary and future needs, interests, and concerns of the Indian society. On a lighter note, we have made peace a legal concept because we believe that we need thousands of laws for peace. So my remarks, will focus on the black law or the statue laws and the peace. Heading the Rashtriya Aksa University, the national security and policy mission of the country in the field of education. We at the university, particularly in the area of internal security and police administration, and I'm just covering one particular area, that is criminal law. We see that our Indian Penal Code has about 23 chapters and 511 sections. Our code pro, criminal pro, code pro procedure have 37 chapters and 484 sections. The Indian Evidence Act has 11 chapters and 167 sections. The Police Act has 46 sections. The whole purpose of giving you these statistics is there's these thousands of sections which are just codified through these four major acts for keeping law and order to achieve peace or to maintain peace itself is, in my view, epitome of how our nation through this IPC, CRPC, Evidence Act and the Police Act 
work towards not only achieving law and order, but the purpose of law and order is also the peace. Similarly, if you go to another area, which again we teach at the Rashtriya Raksha University, is criminology and behavioral science, or we can say brain and behavioral science. The science of how people think and act, it provides a promising, complementary new approach to advance peace. As you all know, there are no laws to regulate behavioral science as such, but there are laws which regulate our behavior with a purpose that we can better understand do's and do nots of exclusion and inclusion in a diverse country like ours and how we can prevent the spontaneous eruption of violence and how we can understand the intergroup dynamics of all emotion focused power imbalances in peace talks, whether these imbalances, act, uh, imbalances exist. When we talk peace with farm protest, farm laws protesters, or people in LWE area. But this is very, very important. The third important focus is of this university is the coastal maritime security and peace. And again, I'm, I'm looking at the statutory laws. The whole framework of coastal and maritime law of India focus on multiple aspects, all aiming at security and peace. The coastal regulation zone, which has its genesis in 1986, Environmental Protection Law. This particular CRGR Act aimed to provide pursuit of life with due regard to coastal flora and fauna and environment. As we know, more than 330 million, 33 crore Indians live in coastal areas. And for them, enactment of CRZ was promising in their search for peaceful coexistence with the nature. And therefore, if we disturb the tenets of the CRZ law, it has proportionate but also disproportionate effects on the peaceful pursuit of coastal lives. And when I say lives, I'm talking living as well as non-living organisms. The university also focuses on artificial intelligence. And a question may come, what are the relations between artificial intelligence and peace? But ours is an attempt to see how we can use artificial intelligence for helping the lawmaking and law implementing establishment for peace. As we all know, artificial intelligence will have greater possibility in identifying the hotspots and even possible impacts of future of war and conflicts. In a country like ours, artificial intelligence holds huge promise for various types of conflicts. But let me also reiterate that artificial intelligence can be a double-edged sword. The same artificial intelligence can be exploited by peace breakers or non-peace loving people for the short term wasted interest. A law student 
will immediately suggest we need to regulate use of artificial intelligence and a law interpreter will be too happy to rush to a similar conclusion while working on the talinan manual on cyber security which is kind of code for information technology cyber security and to an extent artificial intelligence i became vividly aware the necessity to strengthen our it and cyber security laws with the aim to give privacy and social space to users of these new technologies and at the same time ensuring that our personal pursuits of happiness and peace are having symbiotic relations with community peace and happiness it is mutually inclusive it is not mutually exclusive and that is indeed the task of a law maker and also duty of the law interpreter to not rush and judge upon the right to privacy without giving due interpretation to the duty of everyone to ensure the community right to live in peace and happiness as well another important area is the language and peace friends official languages act of india of 1963 is an act to provide for the languages which may be used for the official purposes of the union for transaction of business in parliament for central and state acts and for certain purposes of high courts this is the preamble of that but the deeper philosophy of this preamble is which finds no express mention in the act is to bring about peaceful relations among governments communities and political parties we know for sure how much contribution this official languages act of 1963 has made in ensuring the peace and integrity of our nation as i said although word peace is nowhere mentioned in the act the pursuit of peace was the real genesis of the act in other words law is a vehicle to attain the peace another area of suraksha is the forensic science and peace here we all are confronting to catalyze global peace or for the matter national peace through the strengthening of forensic science it is very important that we can achieve global peace and national peace of standing forensic science when we are talking of the minority communities an excellent scholarship by ahmed bharadwin bharadwin he exactly analyzed how we can catalyze the global peace through the standing of forensic science in sharia law the findings of this study so that forensic science application is relevant to sharia law based on precedent sharia cases this specifically involves islamic evidence law civil law criminal law criminal procedure code which fulfills some of the suggestions of the sustainable development goals another important aspect of forensic science is the humanitarian forensic action it is a novel field of application of forensic science which has evolved to assist the humanitarian response to armed conflicts 
or situations of violence and catastrophic events. But as we celebrated on 10 December, the Human Rights Day and the MIT School of Governance and World Peace University, Dr. Vishwanath Karar and the entire team have been at forefront of reading international humanitarian and human rights law, which say the thinking of forensic anthropology by United Nations, by ICRC, and other peace building organizations. And this law helps us to see how the new field of application of forensic medicine and science needs further development, integration, and research to meet the growing needs at global scale. Our own Indian Evidence Act has profound philosophy in this respect. And when our judiciary interpret the nuances of the Evidence Act in variety of situations, ranging from criminal act to corporate behavior, they all are mindful of this innate concept. So let me end by quoting what Chanak had to say. That the happiness and peace attained by those satisfied by the need of spiritual tranquility are not attained by greedy persons restlessly moving here and there. And in the context of today's elocution on law and peace, I can only say, as my predecessors of this seminar mentioned, making of law is a long drawn out process. It requires feeling of pain and pleasure. It requires patience and perseverance because though peace is an abstract concept, as I said in the very beginning of my lecture, we all believe that the vehicle called law can only help us to achieve this abstract concept of peace. Once again, I thank you very much for this opportunity and look forward to interacting with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Indeed, uh, the, the, the way com in the comprehensive way that you covered all the concepts, uh, I'm sure everyone, all the attendees uh, of this symposium, which are close to 500, would definitely be benefited uh, from this thought. I would request if revered Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karat, sir, would like to say a few words. Sir? Thank you so much. Vimal Patel ji, on all the other speakers, Bharat Bhushan ji, Lalit Basin sahab, and my very learned friends. I'm especially and in particular delighted to listen to the words of wisdom spoken by all these great scholars and thinkers and philosophers in the field of law, especially law and judiciary. I think uh, as regard this, I can only, I am not the authority in the field of law, but I know what law I should follow myself. For the rule of life is my mission. And the rule of law of any nation must run close to the rule of life of the people. And the rule of the life of the people must run close to the rule of mother nature because the rule of mother nature is the rule of cosmic Brahman, the creator, the almighty God. The rule of law, Vishwatmak Ishwar ki kalpana hai. Nature's law are uniform and never changing. So what should be my way of life? What should be the rule for my living of myself? Bimal Patel ji, bahut dinon ke baad aapki mulaqat ho rahi hai. When I had come to 
the Hague Appeal for Peace Conference in Netherlands. We had a long discussion, we met before. But when I listened to your views just now, I think uh, an educational institution like the World Peace University, to trying to understand what should be the exact mission of any institution like World Peace University, and talking of law and peace is something very, very relevant today because I can only say that I have a small paragraph here in front of me regarding the understanding of the role of science and spiritual component of life. I'm speaking about life itself, the living beings, the human race, are all the living beings on this Mother Earth. To my mind, basically here I have written, friends, you are all aware that the entire world is passing through a tense and chaotic stage even worse than what was experienced during the two world wars. The present one is also a war, a war between good and evil, sacrifice and greed, virtues and vices, tolerance and stubbornness, religious coexistence and fundamentalism, traditional time-tested values and quick gains and so on. The various issues involved are not only local, and restricted to one's own country, but are global as well. The world is witnessing mind-boggling scientific and industrial developments like artificial intelligence, internet, IT, nanotechnology, Google, journey to the outer space, and whatnot on the one hand, while on the other hand, there is a total chaos, confusion, terrorism, bloodshed and massacre, in the name of some caste, creed, race, religion, and the trivial issues like bondage of nations. It is most unfortunate that in spite of the amazing and wonderful developments of, for all possible enjoyments, material comforts for leading a luxurious life and for the welfare of the mankind, the family system, which is vital for our survival, is on the rocks and is certainly deteriorating rapidly because of the decline of the mutual faith, affection, true love, loyalty, and trust, neglecting their religious duties towards each other, which is very fundamental of the ideal family system, which is very vital for the living of the society. I think it's a very wonderful discussion which has been taken by the team of all people. Thank you, Bapat and Mr. Rahul Karad and everybody, and especially the Chancellor, Mr. Ravi Chutnis, for choosing a very appropriate topic and getting the advice from these great learned scholars and thinkers and philosophers and experts in the field of law and trying to understand what is our duty. I can say, may I have been listening to these views since morning and I'm trying to understand what is my duty on this occasion. What should the law for myself? What should the rules and regulations for my day-to-day -day working fields? I think there can be a lot which can be said, but I think it is a very appropriate topic, especially on the background of this coronavirus, the so COVID-19. And Bimal Patelji, I think you know it very well that this horrifying biological weapons, the chemical weapons. We need to have a very unique law at the global level. I don't know where the Security Council members are sitting now. They are also hiding themselves in their houses. Are we not to control or have some authority at the Security Council level or at those levels of the countries like the China, the Britain, the Americans? who have been the very powerful nations, but who are trying to prove that they are the supreme and possibly one triggering can destroy this entire, entire globe. That danger is looming around. And I think we are sitting on a ticking bomb all the time. So what should be the law? If you want to really pre make prevail the peace on this mother earth, this entire universe, which comprises of each and every smallest of the small particle, which is conscious, which is intelligent. 
on this background, at least for myself being a teacher, being a learner, I don't consider myself to be an expert, but after listening all these views, I have a sincere feeling that the time has come that we have to think very passionately with emotions and the responsibility to understand our duty. I think there can be a lot many things can be said, but uh, I think we need to think about what is the culture of peace, how to promote the world peace, and what laws, what rules, what regulations, which will make us understand this very responsibility and what should be the education system too. So many things can be said, but sometime we have to meet again. I really invite you, all those great people, this very dome about which I mentioned has been made two, three times. I can only say that the one visit for some occasion, I'll create the occasion and you must see it's a very wonderful spiritually oriented scientific laboratory here which tells about the laws of nature and life. The body and the brain and the soul and the mind are the four constituent parts of a, any living being. And it gives a very wonderful expression of how and what way to live and what way not to live. Religion, which is the duty as said by Swami Vivekananda, here you can understand what is your duty and my duty or each and everyone's duty. That's my personal feeling and accordingly I will try to understand and possibly uh, the today's discussion will certainly help me. That's why I'm sitting with so much of curiosity to understand what should be the law, what should the rule and how the society should behave, how they should proceed. They should understand the meaning and essence and philosophy behind science and spirituality. It's not a blind faith. These are also the laws of nature. Sant Dhyaneshwara has said, Ata Vishwatma ke Deve. The entire universe itself is a manifestation of pure intelligence and consciousness. He is the wonderful narration which has been given by Sant Dhyaneshwara. I have a small booklet in my hand, Vimalji. This was published last year. Is hai, the nine universal secrets or nine universal principles and laws of human life enunciated by philosophers and Naneshara 730 years back. Sasso tis sal pehle ki baat hai, umar hai sola sal ki. Our son Naneshara is making a narration, enunciation on Bhagavad Gita. Bhavartha Deepika. Gyaneshwari, whatever the name it may be, nothing but what you said about Bhagavad Gita and Lord Krishna too. I think we need to really understand, don't call them as a blind faith. These are the real and essential features of the law and the rules and regulations for the survival of the humanity, for the promotion of culture of peace in the society. That's my personal feeling as regards this, what subject is being discussed. I'm really grateful to all of you, friends. I'm, I'm thankful and welcome sometime. I, I, it's, a, it's a miracle in the whole, in the known human history, it is said. I was not knowing. I'm not the maker. I'm not the doer. I'm just an instrument to make this happen. It has been evolved. It's a very unique one. And that is a laboratory, I'm telling you again, not a structure or a monument. And accordingly, it is going to give a great message, possibly our personal discussions on this occasion at the World Peace Dome itself, in the name of Naneshwara to Einstein. The rule is from son Naneshwara to Einstein. That's the journey. And maybe that we may have a better discussion again. Possibly I'll ask Mr. Rahul and Chitnis to call these great people sometime at our own invitation. And let us discuss something a little bit more, how this can help you to promote this culture of peace through the Indian traditions and the culture, the Indian philosophy. Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, Vasudeva Kutumbakam are very one simple words, but they have a great essence and philosophy behind. And we need to convey this to the whole world community. That is the real expectation. Thank you, Bimalji. Dhanneva. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed for collaborating uh, your thoughts.
and I'm really happy to share with you, Revered Prof. Dr. Vishwanath Tharat, sir, and everyone basically on the panel, that the chief guest of today's session, the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Deepak Mishra ji, has joined us. Let us, let us uh, give him a round of applause and welcome him, that he has really uh, gracious of him that he has taken time out and joined us today. Thank you, sir. We would like to welcome, uh, on behalf of everyone in the organizing team, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining. My friends, now it's time when I invite the special guest of honor of this session, the public policy advocate, international corporate and commercial lawyer, and vice president of SAC Law, and the special TV host guest anchor at Sunset TV. It is indeed our honor and privilege to welcome the special guest of honor, advocate Hemant Batraji. But before I invite uh, advocate Hemant Batraji to address the gathering, I would like to request my technical team to please relay a small film made on life and work of Advocate Himan Patraji. Advocate Himan Batra is a globally recognized lawyer with almost 30 years of experience in the areas of constitutional, civil, criminal, corporate, commercial and transactional laws as well as laws dealing with the white-collared and economic offences. His experience ranges from policy formulation, legislation and regulations drafting to preparing global reports on diverse subjects complemented by hands-on legal advisory and law practices in these areas at transnational level and domestically in India. He is qualified with professional degrees as well as official certificate courses. He has achieved a first-class score through his academic career. He has obtained distinctions in diverse subjects. He is an elected lifetime member of the General Assembly of the Union of International Association, a research institute and documentation centre based in Brussels. He was appointed chairperson of IICLAM, International Infrastructure and Construction Law Arbitration Moot. It was founded by National University of Singapore, Singapore International Arbitration Centre and National Law University, Delhi. He was appointed to the Leadership Committee of ICAAP by the Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. We warmly welcome Advocate Hemant Batra. Indeed, sir, it is our honor and privilege to have you here today. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Honorable uh, Justice Deepak Mishra, former Chief Justice of India, and other justices on the panel, Dr. Lalit Basin, one of our senior leaders at the bar, notable uh, dignitaries, Professor Karad, Rahul Karad, distinguished guests, teaching staff, students, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure being part of this inaugural session of the first international symposium on law and peace organized by the MIT. World Peace Institutions University. I've been asked to address the gathering on the topic regarding reforms required in the, in the judiciary. And, and, and the time slot allocated to me is uh, about 15 minutes. So I'll get straight to the topic as time is short and, and brief. Uh, uh, you know, if I was to say this from the perspective of a lawyer, because you know lawyers love their voices. But here, there are defined timelines, so I'll respect that. Let us first discuss broadly as to why are reforms required at all in the society. Let me begin by quoting uh, William O. Douglas, you know, judge of the Supreme Court of the United States in the 20th century. You know, he said that the search for static security in the law and elsewhere is misguided. The, the fact is security can only be achieved, can only be achieved 
through constant change, adapting old ideas that have outlived their usefulness to the current facts. What are the current facts if one was to talk about the Indian judiciary? Well, there are about 73,000 cases pending before the Supreme Court and about 44 million cases. That is 4.4 crore cases pending in all the courts put together in India. And, you know, quoting from uh, an online source, in 2018, Niti Ayog had brought out a strategy paper where it was concluded that at the then prevailing rate of disposal of cases in our courts, it would take more than 324 years to clear the backlog. 324 years to clear the backlog. And the pendency at that time was 29 million cases. And today it is almost the double. Now, cases that had been in the courts for more than 30 years numbered more than 65,000, to be precise, 65,695 in December 2018. By January 2021, which is this year, it had risen more than 60% to 1 lakh plus cases pending for more than 30 years. Now, what do these facts and statistics demonstrate? Well, it demonstrates that something is seriously wrong somewhere. And we must acknowledge it with all honesty, candidness, and magnanimity. We won't become small by any means by this sincere confession. Now, before suggesting the kinds of reforms required in the Indian judiciary, let me first compliment the Indian judiciary with all genuineness. And Justice Deepak Mishra has been one of the best example, I would say, in our, in, in our justice dispensation. Our system of governance is based on the separation of powers with a concept of checks and balances. Legislature makes laws and public policies, whereas the executive enforces it. And both these organs have enormous powers and wide domain of public dealings and administration. All these powers and mandates make them vulnerable and susceptible to excesses, or if I may say, unrestrained exercise of authority whether knowingly or unknowingly. Judiciary in India has played a significant role since India's independence as a custodian of the constitution of India and the rule of law. They have constantly checked and balanced the other organs of the governance. And I'm sure Justice Deepak Mishra will touch upon that, you know, because when he was heading the Supreme Court, we have had some landmark judgments in that regard. The judiciary has overwhelmingly prevented excesses and breaches of the fundamental rights, human rights, and laws. Now, having said that, somewhere I feel that judiciary could not I would not say did not, could not reform itself as much as was the need of the time and society. The judiciary obviously cannot survive in vacuum. It must change and, and recast itself so as to meet the changing norms and values of the society. Lack of reforms stifle growth because separation of powers in India is, is, is not a model of watertight chambers. Lack of reforms in one organ of governance causes collateral damage and dampens overall development of a nation. Let me now you know, quickly touch upon the kinds of reforms which can be rapidly introduced 
in the judicial dispensation. This is my thought process. You know, uh, I'm not a very active litigation lawyers, but uh, litigation lawyer, beg your pardon, but, but from a public policy perspective. First and foremost, you know, the reform which has been effectively suggested and mooted even by the current Chief Justice of India, Honorable Chief Justice Ramanna, is about mediation. That, you know, the, the reform is about introducing an effective system of alternative dispute resolution. I'm not talking about arbitration, and nor was he, to my understanding. I'm talking about conciliatory mediation. Before filing any dispute or case in a court of law or tribunal, one must mandatorily make a professional and legitimate and authentic endeavor to resolve the conflict or dispute amicably, amicably by mediation. In many developed countries of the world, which I've even recorded in one of my books, in many developed countries of the world, including Australia, the lawyer who files the case the lawyer who files the case must also sign a declaration with the case as a prerequisite that he or she has made all possible efforts to resolve and settle the dispute before filing the case. And the lawyer can be reprimanded by the court, reprimanded by the court if the declaration is found to be false or misleading. Now, second reform is about usage of technology. And this reform has also been strongly you know, propagated by uh, another judge of the, of the Supreme Court, a senior judge, one of the senior most judges of the Supreme Court, Justice Dhananjay Chandrachur, very recently. You know, I mean, he, he has been propagating about introducing technology in the dispensation of justice. And definitely, you know, technology is, is a rapid reform as well, because, uh, you know, I feel there are many reforms one can talk about, which I can think of myself, but, but, you know, we have to discuss the ones which can be executed rapidly or swiftly. You know, I mean, if, if I was to tell you that, let us invest hugely in the judicial civil infrastructure, like having more and more court rooms and, 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 and buildings and, and, and chambers. I feel that would, in the Indian context, take years and years together, you know, to, to have that kind of infrastructure in place. And here, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a uh, French poet and, and novelist, Victor Hugo, many of you would have read that very famous phrase of his, which, which goes as, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But that holds very true in today's time for technology. You know, and, and not only technology, I would say even artificial intelligence. You know, it, it, both of these aspects of technology, uh, they, they are unstoppable now. And, and, and there is nothing wrong in it, I feel. You know, uh, artificial intelligence has been subject matter of discussion, debate, criticism as well. But, but it is born out of natural intelligence. Artificial intelligence has not come out of the space. It, is, it has been created by human intelligence. So why can't petty disputes and issues like, you know, traffic violations, cases of small consumer disputes, conflicts, or refunds from service providers, can be settled by uh, artificial intelligence. Why not? You know, I mean, you put in the details in an automated form and matter gets instantly resolved. You know, if, if our income tax returns can get scrutinized by a software and artificial intelligence, which is financially sort of a complicated structure or phenomena, then why not introduce some similar segments of judicial dispensation? You know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, smaller uh, conflicts and, and disputes, which are quite sort of run of the mill and, and uh, easy to resolve. I would not like to, you know, touch the debate about the faceless adjudication, because that is something which will take 
lot of time to discuss and and uh, and, and can be kept for some other day. Uh, I, I'm not too much in favor of faceless adjudication of serious disputes. Globally, uh, you know, talking about companies, you know, they, they have resorted to ODR, online dispute resolution, e-mediations, you know, for instance, eBay, PayPal, and ICANN. You know, they're the, they're the front runners in, in online dispute resolutions. eBay's ODR system is a high volume OD, ODR process that addresses disputes from a system perspective angle. eBay handles over 60 million disputes, six crore disputes every year through their online dispute resolution system. And predominantly disputes are like items have not been received or items have not been received as described or the items are you know, unpaid and so on, you know, the regular disputes, but solving six crore disputes every year. Now related to technology is the point and reform regarding online and, and virtual uh, hearings. And, and we have seen during COVID times, you know, uh, virtual hearings, online hearings, and, and most people have embraced it, you know, with open mind. It's, it's a glo global phenomenon now. And, and we all have come so close to one another through this medium of virtuality. I'm addressing an event in, in Pune while sitting in Delhi, you know, that, that is productivity and efficiency. I mean, that, that's, that's big convenience, I would say. And, and, and we need a big number of new judges to be appointed, undoubtedly. Uh, but why not engage judges on contractual terms? You know, wh why can't we have law professors, senior lawyers, and even former judges, you know, uh, adjudicating matters? You know, for instance, uh, respected Justice Deepak Mishra is, is, is so active even today. Why can't he still continue to, to hold court? You know, uh, so, and, and if not the physical virtual court, why can't he hold virtual court? Because it is not easy to find judges of his stature and with his caliber. So how, why are we wasting such uh, judges, you know? And another reform which comes to my mind is about training of judges and training of judges by the academicians and, and by, by law teachers with regard to pressy writing of the judgments. You know, today we find judgments which are thesis in itself. You know, I mean, you need 10 sets of lawyers to interpret that judgment. You know, we need to exercise compression in judgments. You know, judgment should be written like a gist. Why do judgments lay out such long chronology, etc. I mean, they can be made in excerpts, the chronology or the written submissions. Why, why do we have to record all those in the judgment? Just put them as an excerpt and, and your verdict should be maybe two to three pages. That's it. And, and we, we should not need lawyers to explain these judgments to litigants. You know, litigants should be able to just go through the judgment and, and understand. You know, we don't need to use Shakespearean English in our judgment, you know, because we know a person who is sitting on the bench, he has to be a learned, brilliant, analytical, and a person of judicious mind. So we all have to have faith in our judges. When we'll have faith, trust, and confidence in our, in our judges, even if they'll give a two-page or three-page order, we will respect that. You know, we'll value that. So th that reform also will need to come not only vis-a-vis -vis judiciary, but also people who are using the judicial system. They also need a lot of orientation. You can't just go on criticizing judgments uh, sweepingly. We all need to trust the judiciary. Now, this I, I feel is an uh, important reform. So I, I'll be by and large closing my address now. Uh, there are there are several other reforms, you know, if, if you go through research papers, you know, people talk about decriminalization of regulatory offenses and, and, and more and, and there, there are a lot many reforms, but, but, but I think time is short. And perhaps we will keep uh, 
other reforms for some other time as professor carnard said that why don't carnard said that why, why not you people visit so maybe when we get an occasion to visit we, we can in phys, uh, physically we can sort of you know have we'll have more time to interact with the students so i'll close my address by uh, quoting lew wallace a famous american lawyer diplomat and politician you know he said to begin a reform to begin a reform go uh, not go into the places of the great and rich don't go to the places of great and rich go rather to those whose cups of happiness are empty go to the poor and humble they are the ones who need reforms thank you so much god bless all of you thank you and thank you justice deepak mishra it's great to see you yeah. indeed indeed uh, so the pleasure was all ours thank you very much for taking time out thank you advocate batra ji i think you really passionately shared your mind and this is uh, what really when we were conceiving the conference the truly solution based approach how do we adopt while building up this uh, institution the first is international symposium of peace and law so i am very very thankful you you gave so many ideas i think we we, we can pursue it together sir you are already at important position there and and various international bodies and we at our center here at the education group many such activities we are doing and uh, our education system is always particularly private institutions they shy away the academy also carry little fear of you know the uh, the our political system social system they generally never comment like the western world we all have to really learn that we we can really make a difference as a change makers thank you so much for all that wonderful input thank you indeed as rightly said by executive president sir indeed it was pleasure and a treat to listen to you advocate himant patra ji thank you sir thank you very much uh, for being here my friends uh, on such occasions when we are deliberating upon the very important and sensitive issues which are ultimately going to impact uh, our motherland and our individual lives it is important for all of us to have some important message that we can take in our hearts with us uh, through such proceedings we have uh, our honorable vice chancellor of mit world peace university professor dr r m chitni sir with us i would like to request if uh, he can bind all of us with a oath which is going to be a very very important takeaway of this inaugural session i request my technical team to display honorable vice chancellor on the screen as well as the video uh, the the screen which will show us the oath both at the same time honorable vice chancellor is requested uh, uh, sir you are requested to kindly read the oath so that everyone in the audience can store it in their hand uh, in their hearts over to you sir thank you dr babat sir on the platform of mit world peace universities international symposium on law and peace we the sons and daughters of mother earth being the global citizens assure to abide by the duties and responsibilities of an ideal citizen and hereby affirm that we will endeavor to promote peace and harmony through the lens of law in the pursuit of justice thank you thank you sir thank you very much uh... thank you very much for giving us all of us that important message that we all would remember and act upon thank you sir thank you very much my friends i'm sure uh, you heard revered professor dr vishwanath karat sir talking about a monument which is dedicated to world peace and entire humanity some of us uh, might have experienced uh, the monument the philosopher sanjay gyaneshwara world peace prayer hall and world peace prayer library the the world peace dome as we uh, know it but some of us may not have been so fortunate to experience uh, the world peace dome so with the help of technology once again i would like to share that experience with all of you i would like to request my technical team to kindly release a small film made on philosopher sanjay ganeshwara world peace prayer hall and world peace library
This country has always propagated one thought, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, my dear friends. I must say that in the entire history after the independence since 1947, this is one of the unique steps towards the contribution of universal humanity. I appeal to the Vice President and Honorable Chief Minister to recognize this World Peace Dome as a structure of national and global importance and support to promote it in such a way that it evolves as one of the prominent tourism destinations of the world. We should remember and respect like Professor Vishwanath Karat and millions of people like that and remember the great service they have done. They should be remembered forever. That is also equally important for all of us. This is the message of this dome. This is the idea of the dome. This is the tallest, not only in size, but also in ideas. But if it takes away the rest of the days of my life and gives me one day where I can come back and look at this magnificent dome, magnificent message to the rest of the world, to me, this is not just the biggest dome in the world. To me, this is the biggest idea, the biggest message to the world. Science without religion is lame and we all know this religion without science is blind. का मान नहीं करोगे तब तक श्री राम का मान संपूर्ण नहीं होगा आप याद रखिए केवल जय श्री राम से बात नहीं बनेगी जय सीता राम कही है ना होता हमको लगता है कि आज गांधी जी हो चाहे जो कोई हो सबका इशारा विश्व शांति